Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Scope Principle presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of scope that govern the operation of God's laws gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws and answers audience questions about the principles. Recorded on the 20th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. I had three people approach me for questions. Now, guys, you've already been told about that Friday night. So, now, That's one of... <laughs> sorry, if Mary had been here, you'd have been out. <laughs> but... One of them is at you, Adria, so you know, you've got an allowance for the fact that it's your first time. And Pierre, you've been told before, last chance, man, for you. Now, Eva, I notice, is not even here. Is she gone? She has gone? I'm here. I'm, here. I'm sorry, my dear sister, but I have to remove you. Okay? Yeah, you've, you've now gone too far for me. Does that make sense? So this will be your last, this will be your last group, um, your last session. Um, do you want to stay on the mic for the session or would you like somebody else to have it? I can do the mic. You sure? Yeah, okay. I suppose. No worries. Thank you. Um, even though that was the case, I still arrived two minutes before my start time. And most of you arrived two minutes after my start time. And in amongst that time, I also read 44 questions. Interesting, huh? So what does that tell me? I set a time. Can you please be here for the time? <laughs> Thank you. We're now five minutes late as a result. Now, can you see straight away how we have our own little things going on? And we go, oh, I'll just do one more thing. Or I'll just do this, and I'll just do that, and I'll just get that done. And before you know it, you've got 50, 70 people and um, they all just do this a little bit and do that a little bit and do this a little bit. You can see how things get disorganised pretty rapidly, right? Mm. So that's uh, something we need to consider. All right, let's start by looking at these scope principles. <laughs> yes. How have you gone with them? Challenged. challenged. Most people challenged, yes. Okay, so we, we have to have a look at some terms here, don't we? And the key to understanding these scope principles is to understanding the terms, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> so we need to go through the understanding of these terms so you, you can get them properly. So let's look at creation. Creation includes any matter or creature from the smallest particle to the most complex living creation of the human soul. So we're basically saying every single one, one of God's creations, and that includes, of course, all matter, whether you classified as living or non-living, and right up to the human soul being the highest creation of God. So that's creation. So whenever we're talking about creation, we're referring to that scope of creation. Energy includes information, energy, emotion, thought, communication, relationship or interplay between creation, within or between creation. So what we're saying there is that there's flow of energy which occurs inside of a creation and also from the creation to other creations that are external to the creation itself. Does that make sense? And we're defining energy as to being any one of those flows of energy. Now, information uh, is coded into the creation itself. So things like information is coded in your DNA, for example. So that's an example of energy storing information inside of a, of a person, inside of the cell, in fact. We're talking about emotion being energy, thought being energy, communication, me speaking even physically is creating an energy which creates a sound which then you can receive the energy through your eardrum and then hear that sound and then translate it and interpret it. But it's still the transmission of energy. So. Verbal communication is the transmission of energy. So too are other forms of communication. You can communicate feelings, which are actually far more powerful to communicate, and that's also 
the transmission of energy from from firstly it begins within and then often it leaves the creature the created creature and enters the other creature or the other parts of the universe properties include all properties characteristics attributes attractions and restrictions of the creation itself that are built into the creation itself so these are these these properties determine what the creation is capable of doing it also determines the creation's potential what it's potentially capable of doing inbuilt rules means a set of laws and potentials built into the creation that govern the creation's properties and govern the creation's energy so it governs what the characteristics attributes and attractions and restrictions of the creation will be and they also govern what energy is capable of flowing into and out of the creation right. an external rules means a set of laws and potentials created by created com creation combinations now i'm going to have to draw some of that obviously aren't i <laughs> external to the individual creation that affect the creation's properties and energy in other words like for example if i if there was no atmosphere in this room <laughs> now what i just said is i would be talking but you wouldn't know what i'm saying all right because the external creation of atmosphere which is a combination of laws and property uh, and and creations themselves put together with a combination of laws that govern it determines whether me producing sound is whether i'm capable of producing sound now my body is still able to produce sound but i just can't produce the sound in a place where there's no atmosphere i need the atmosphere in order to produce the sound does that make sense to you so in other words I need a set of I have a set of internal rules that determines that I can speak but to you it says if I can't speak if there's no atmosphere allowing my speech so the ex the external rules we're, we're defining as a set of laws and potentials that created by created combinations that are separate to me that uh, determine what I'm capable of doing external to myself internally I'm still capable but externally I'm no longer capable if those laws don't exist. Does that make sense? So there's many examples we could give of that and we'll draw a few diagrams to show you a few things with regard to these terms. Now the beauty of what God has created with scope is that if you think about it this allows for things to get together and have effects combina combined effects as I said if there was no atmosphere in this room I could not speak to you even though the creation itself my body is able to produce speech I would not be capable of speaking to you unless the atmosphere existed does that make sense and so therefore I am dependent on the atmosphere existing before I can speak to you so even though my internal state is that i'm capable of generating speech the way my body's been designed i still would not be able to generate that speech without the external creations of supplying the condition for speech hmm. uh, barbara you'd like to ask only on that is it just that we can't hear it the receiver because you can still internally produce it no if a, if if there's no atmosphere there's no atmosphere by which vibrations can be transmitted from me to you so even though so so while your eardrum still works and my speech my 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 voice box still works i, I there's no atmosphere so i can't actually generate the vibrations which you can hear does that make sense yep Yep. So it's very much dependent upon the external rule set that's created by creative combinations outside of me that allows me to do what I do. Yeah. This is one thing we need to come to terms with that that in creation, what I am capable of doing is very much dependent on other creation combinations that allow me to do it. 
which is an interesting concept if you think about it, in terms of allows us to see that in many ways the, the um, New Age concepts of we're joined to each other in certain ways are, are true, aren't they? We, we need things in order to be able to accomplish what we can accomplish. And that's the case throughout the universe, even right up to the union condition. You still have external matter that you interact with and without the existence of that matter and, and being combined in certain ways, governed by certain laws, you would not be able to do the things that you can do. Even though the internal rules, the inbuilt rules and the properties and the energy inside of the being allows it to happen, there's still no external rules allowing it to happen. And so you need a combination of internal rules that allow things to happen and external rules that allow it to happen as well. And, and that tells us that we can't live in a vacuum, as the saying goes. Um, we're not in a vacuum. We need external creation in order to accomplish and do the things we do. Yeah. So the old saying, no, no man is an island, is sort of a truth, isn't it? Yes, for that reason. Thanks. If we come... Um, so does the spirit world have its own atmosphere and that's why that when spirits talk we can't hear them? Yes. Okay. Mm. Yes, has an atmosphere, breathable atmosphere from a spirit perspective, yes. Certainly. Yep. Fabio? So the external rules change as, can they change as well? With, like, with your inbuilt rules, so just say you develop some way and then does the external rules, can they alter? Well, they can be altered by your development, certainly, or by what you choose to do, certainly. They are also uh, frequently determined by um, conditions that, it, that are external to you that you have no control over. So, so at the moment, you don't have any control over this atmosphere the gravitational pull and a number of other things have control over the atmosphere and you don't have control over it, you just utilise it, right? So, so it just depends on how interactive these particular external rules are as to whether you can change them or, or they are permanently fixed and there's nothing you can do about them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So for exa an example of that would be if on Earth, the mass of the Earth means that we have a gravitational pull of an average of 9.8 metres per second squared, but when you travel to the Moon, the gravitational pull is much less because that's the atmosphere you're now at or in. It also has no breathable atmosphere, and so therefore if you took off your mask, you wouldn't be able to speak to each other. There's no oxygen via, via which vibrations can occur, and uh, there's no atmosphere via, via which vibrations could occur aside from the ground itself, so you could actually you know, tap things on the ground and get transmission that way, but you wouldn't be able to get it through the atmosphere. And as a result, you wouldn't be able to hear or, or be able to speak to each other without having masks and all the apparatus needed to do so. So that's an ex example of how external, the external rule combination sets do govern what you're capable of achieving, even though in built inside of you, you are capable of it. It doesn't mean that in that atmosphere, you'll be capable of it. Hmm. Okay, we well, right so far, <laughs> Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we want to understand these, so I'm happy to address your questions here. So, does that mean that, sorry, as a collective and as an individual and a collective, we create an atmosphere? Well, no. What I just said to Fab is that we don't actually create the atmosphere. I mean, a spiritual atmosphere. Oh, certainly, we do create a spiritual atmosphere that allows information to pass or not depending on that condition and correct correct so together as a combined group there's an example of this in the robert james lee's material we remember there's an example of um, them going to a seance on earth and there was this medium madam whatever i can't remember her name and she she did it for pay she did it for for profit <laughs> And there was a couple of priests there and a, f and a few other people there and a few people who were just, you know, basically just having fun with it. And that combined to form an atmosphere that attracted a certain group of spirits. It's the atmosphere, the spiritual atmosphere, the love-based atmosphere of that combined condition that created the attraction between that and the group of spirits that were drawn there. Yeah. 
Right, thank you. Make sense? So yes, together you, we have an atmosphere. And from a spirit's perspective, together we have a smell. Together we have a, a, a they can see us a certain way as well. And we have um, feelings that come from us that mix together and combine together that form the atmosphere and so forth. Yep. So a spiritual body is forming atmospheres. But they are emotional atmospheres, which is different to the physical atmosphere I was describing to Fab that we need to even speak. That's different to the emotional atmosphere. Remember, there's different types of energy systems and emotions happens to be one type of energy. But information, thought and communication all happen to be different types of energy, but we're defining them all as energy. Different types of energy being transmitted. Does that make sense? Yeah, Mary? But you're saying that there's external rules that govern how that emotional energy mixes mixes and creates a certain atmosphere. Correct, yes. So the external rule set, the, uh, there's an external rules that govern emotions, besides internal rules that govern emotions, and the external rules that govern emotions determine how all of our emotions mix and therefore provide, create a spiritual atmosphere. Does that, everyone get that? Yep, okay, Barbara, thanks. <coughs> um, so you just said before that um, spirits can smell, smell us. I've often had this question because I feel as if I can smell spirits, particularly yeah, of around course you certain can, but people. It's pretty, like, don't you think that's a pretty bad question? Uh, oh, is let's it? move on, shall we? <laughs> it's not going to waste my time with it. <laughs> We've all, I've already talked about it before too. All right, what else? Is there any other questions? Neil? Sorry, sorry, Viva. Are they the, are they the same elements in the spiritual realm as, as here? Yeah. Are they the same elements? Um, um, no, no, they are actually different kinds of elements. Like you do have what you would co call the equivalent of oxygen mm -hmm. in the spirit world, um, but it's not the same element that we have measured here in the periodic table in the physical periodic table of oxygen. It doesn't. It's not combine. It doesn't combine in the same ways as the oxygen here does, and so forth. So, so the reality is water too. Um, is you have water in the spirit world. It's, uh, but, but it's not the same as the water we have here. It's, it's made of different mm. elemental systems, mm. Mm. Um, which you would classify as dark matter-based dark matter elemental systems. Mm. Okay. Um, so, so, but they work in a very similar way, and, that's, and this is good too, because what it means is, because of the permits principle, I can rely on something here, and then when I get to the spirit world, I'm not stressing out that everything's different, because a lot of things mm -hmm. seem to be the same, even though they're quite different, they seem to be the same. My exper experiential uh, process is much the same, and so I'm not freaked out by the fact that everything's so mm -hmm. different. You know? mm -hmm. and, and another related one is, um, are there going to be more elements discovered here, you know, mm -hmm. on the periodic table, mm -hmm. or is it finite? No, well, potentially everything's infinite, isn't it? Yes. So, <laughs> so, so we can never really say that it's finite. However, there are mathematical uh, processes involved that as the elements get up in their weights, you know, uh, in their atomic weights, it becomes more and more and more difficult for the masses, the, the subatomic particles to stay together, to create them. And as a result of that, there are some practical limitations okay. uh, of the combinations of matter. Um, it's very similar to the combination of matter from a genetic perspective. There are practical limitations. So I'll give you an example of that is where... Um, uh, a human and another human can have sex and, and have a progeny. But a human and a donkey can't have sex and have progeny. And the reason why is because the genetic structures of the two have so many law differences in them that, that it's impossible for the two structures to be combined. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. And so we now have the concept of species mm. as it, resulting from that. And the species is a limitation placed upon the combination of genetic of DNA that occurs for genetic structures. And, and this is a, a good thing because it means mm. that um, 
you can't get these terrible things happening like, you know, a human all of a sudden turning into half animal, half human and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as you'd imagine, would be quite a disaster for the person involved because there'd be lots of ostracism and ridicule and all these other problems. But, but it does allow for genetic mutation and, and, and deform deformation. Mm. So the reality is that the, the emotional structure of the human means that they can deform their own genetic structure beyond the standard 150,000 base pairs of deformation that normally occur mm. in the 3 billion, in mm. the three billion mm. or so base pairs. And as a result of that, they can get deformations in their, in their body structure. Right, right. Does okay. that make sense? Yep, it does. Yeah. Thank you. But, but the human can't mate with a donkey and get donkey human, you know, donk human or whatever. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, you see that in animals too, of course. You know, you've got horses and, you know, mules, donkeys. Mm -hmm. the, that relationship, you can see that some, uh, there's an there's a extent to which the genetic malformation can go. And that extent is then limited by law. Right. So God, God has limited by law the extent to which genetic malformation so can... So the scope is limited? In, um, is that what no, it's just, a, it's just a combination of the inbuilt rules and the external rules saying, this is how far you can go. You can't go any further. That's it. Right. right. So the reality is they can take a gene out of the human and place it in a plant, just one splice of one portion of mm -hmm. the gene, mm -hmm. but they can't take the whole gene genome mm -hmm. and splice it with a plant's genome. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. It's just impossible to do. So, but they can take one portion out because that's just manipulation of the individual branch chains. Mm -hmm. so, so they can try to remove a problem that humans have using genetic manipulation. Of course, you have to question its, um, you know, mm. the, whether we should do it, mm. because at the end of the day, you have to also question. They're trying to do it to fix problems that the humans have created through emotional injuries. Mm. So, so it would be far better to first fix the emotional injury yes. and then look at what we want to do to change the genome. Now, God's given, because of the rules, it, it's possible to change the the genetic structures of things, and we're able to do it. We're, we're able to do it even now. Mm. We're able to do it. Um, the wisdom of doing it, mm. well, that's a different matter altogether, obviously. We need to consider how much our soul condition is impacting upon these things first mm. before we start making changes and adjustments. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank that's you. Good. Okay, is there any other questions about these definitions? It's all fairly, you can start seeing how they work. So let's look at the principles. The principles guarantee creation is governed by law and that new creations and laws can exist by ensuring inbuilt rules within each creation. So we know what that means now. Each creation has an inbuilt set of rules and instinctual process laws that govern it internally. It has inbuilt rules that determine the pot potentials and energy flow and properties. So there's laws that determine the properties of the creation, its energy flow, its capabilities, and, and also its future potentials. So these inbuilt rules are a key part of determining what the creation can do right now and in the future. Then we have external rules affecting the creation's properties and energy. And external rules uh, have an impact upon the one creation. So let's say just the external rules that might create such a thing as temperature transmission, in other words, transmission of heat or coal. That, of course, is also done through different mechanisms. Now, obviously, that has an effect on the human body, which is a creation separate to those things. But the human body has a tolerance of a certain type of heat up until a certain point and a certain type of coal down to a certain point, and that's its only tolerance range. Right? Beyond that point, the inbuilt ru rules of the human body say it's not going to tolerate any more. The human body can't sustain life under those conditions, so it dies. Does that make sense? Now, the tolerance of the spirit body being a higher creation would mean that it's got a higher tolerance. And the re reality is the spirit body can go to physical things that generate heat and actually not feel the heat, right? but it can't go to spiritual things that generate heat and not feel the heat, because the spiritual matter is the 
matter based on dark matter, the different kinds of structures that determine what the matter can do. So external rules allow for expansion of each creation's properties and energy. So in other words, what, what that's really saying, obviously internal rules do it too, but external rules mean that I am capable of doing something and given that I'm capable of receiving things from my external environment, that also has the potential to change what I can do. So I gave an example with atmosphere. If you take an atmosphere away from me, I am now more limited in my speech. My, my, I'm limited in the communication. You give me an atmosphere that I can breathe, now I'm capable of speech and interaction. Obviously, if you take away the atmosphere, I'm also dead within a few minutes, <laughs> which is also a problem, right? So obviously, there's things in my body that needs oxygen to survive. And so therefore, without that oxygen, I'm going to die. It has to be a certain thing in the atmosphere, even in a certain percentage that allows for my body to survive. So the external rules of whatever d is developed to create oxygen levels in the atmosphere is affecting my potential of even my life as a f in physical form. That's an example of these external rules allowing for expansion of the creation's properties or, and energy and even for the limitation of the properties and energy. The external rules allow for new laws and creations. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'll give some examples with this one because I feel I need to give you at least one example so that it's easy to understand what's going on here. And external rules control the flow of energy between creation. So let's have a look, just a basic look. There's a very, it's not, I'm not going to get too scientific here. So just a basic look of how it affects the human body. Now remember, a day ago we started with hydrogen and oxygen elements, right? So hydrogen and oxygen combine in a certain way to make water. Now they combine in that way because oxygen has a set of inbuilt rules which determine that it is short, short of a couple of electrons. Right? And hydrogen has one electron at a time that it is able to give. And as a result of that, we need two of them and one of them, and then they can combine right, to make water. Of course, you can combine them in other ways to make other things. But combined in this way, they make water. Now, hydrogen has a set of inbuilt rules. Oxygen has a set of inbuilt rules. Interestingly enough, if you combine hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and what is it? Ph uh, phosphorus, uh, phosphorus, I think. And hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. I think that's it. You combine these in a certain way, you make DNA. Right? If they're combined in different ways, they have to. They're actually inverse or flipped, and they form two different spirals that are that are different to each other, and they join together, and they create then coded information. Right? Combined in a certain lattice, they, which is, as you know, that helix spiral type of lattice. I forget what it's called now, but um, it produces DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid is is a is an acid that is the branch chain acid well, of which there's three billion combinations of in your in your genetic structure, and that creates you know, your information such as what colour your eyes are going to be, what colour your hair is going to be, so forth and so forth. So here, oxygen, hydrogen and oxygen combined in this way to get water, but here you can see hydrogen and oxygen. I haven't actually written the combinations because they're very, very complex, but the hydrogen and oxygen are also combining with other elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. I'm sure there's one more. Anyway, I'll remember it sooner or later. And and it produces this DNA lattice, which contains coded information. Now, can you see both of those things are needed in the human body? Are they not? So this one created water, but the human body is 70% or so water. And 
this information creates DNA and we have DNA, three billion branch chains, that when you unravel them gives you all the genetic code for what's going to happen in your body in terms of its replication and the replication of each cell. So each cell in your body, that's each, each cell, bones and everything in your body has this code in it, right? That determine what is going to happen with its replication process. Now, because of emotional damage, we have, like I said, around about 150,000 base pairs of these uh, damaged and they can't replicate properly. But that, that's what causes things like old age, sickness in your old age and death eventually actually the death genes involved in that so it's all part of this thing that's going on inside of the dna but here these things are two com th these two things are combining to form all matter within the physical body so they have to combine to form a cell for example right now Let's look at it from an inbuilt external law combination, shall we? Here we have an element which is obviously containing subatomic elements combined in a certain way to form this element. This element, now it's a new element that's being created through the combination of all these subatomic particles, so it's got new rules, internal rules, new inbuilt rules that determine not only its potentials, what it can combine with, but it determines its energy flow, what energy, amount of energy is going to flow in it by itself, and how it can combine. So you, see, you say it's got properties that determine how it can combine. The same goes with hydrogen. It's obviously a combination of subatomic elements, and as an element itself, it now has internal rules that determine how it can combine. So you could say now it's got some internal rules about how it can combine and what it's going to combine with. And this one's got internal rules about how it can combine and what it's going to combine with, what new substances it can form after combination. So it combines under those rules, under those internal rules, it, it combines. Right. Now, can you see, from the point of view of oxygen, hydrogen is an external creation. And from the point of view of hydrogen, oxygen is an external creation. So, so can you see that oxygen and hydrogen are dependent on each other and the properties of each other before combination can occur? So this means that the laws that govern oxygen and the laws that govern hydrogen are obviously quite different because they determine how the different combinations can occur. But because they are elements, they are at the elemental level, they can only combine at this layer with other elements. They can't combine with something of a higher nature. They can only combine with other elements. They can be ingested by things of a higher nature digested, ingested, breathed even, but, but not combined at the structural level. Does you get that? The law prevents it. So you can't have an oxygenated human uh, in the sense of, you know, a human that now is half oxygen and half human. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because that is physical impossibility. You could say it's a species difference, but uh, you know, obviously oxygen doesn't have a species, but... But you could, you could liken it like that. There's laws that govern it, that stop it from being able to do that. So the human can ingest it and can even crack it away from other atmospheric particles, but it can't actually combine with it at the genetic level. So water has a set, new set of rules now that apply to it, does it not? And you can crack it down and beat it back to its original form even. Two hydrogens and one oxygen, you can do that. But when you do it, it loses the law that controlled the water is no longer existing anymore because it's now back to these particular particles. So the law controlling water is only applicable to water. And that's the case with any com creation combination. And basically what is happening is this. We have a creation, 
and we have another creation. Those two creations combine to form the new creation. We have laws. Let me just uh, see if I can get another colour here. We have laws that govern that creation and laws that govern that creation and the laws combine to form a new set of laws that govern that creation. Does that make sense? Yep. And that happens all the way up the chain and all the way down the chain. It's the same principle. You follow? And that's basically the scope principle. So what that means is that here, over here, we've now got the same hydrogen, which has the same properties as this hydrogen, of course, and the same oxygen, which has the same properties as this oxygen, right? But there are different combinations that are possible of those elements if they're mixed with other elements, which allows for branch chain to occur which is a necessary part of the coding of what happens to the cell. Now, you could say that each one of these have an individual law, that hydrogen there is the same law that governs this hydrogen here. Same law. This oxygen is governed by the same law by, that this oxygen is governed by. This carbon is governed, obviously, by a different set of laws at the elemental level. Nitrogen the same, phosphorus the same. And so what you end up with is combinations of these now being possible because they are combining at the elemental level. The law defines what it's possible of, how it's possibly combining. So they all form law, 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 all different laws now form combination of one law defining a branch chain and how it can be actually put together, right? And then that combines to form the structure that's this nine, this, sorry, three billion branch chain combinations that form the information for a cell, which is another governed by other laws, to exist. Do you follow? So we have a combination of creations creating a new creation that's higher, and a combination of these creations creating a new creation that's higher. And they have the same going on with the laws. We have a combination of laws creating a new set of laws that govern the new creation. And we have a combination of laws there governing a new set of laws for the higher creation. And so forth and so forth. All right. If we go to Max and then Mary. So are you saying that the combined laws create the new higher law? Mm. But it's not a that's not a law that exists of its own. No, sake before that's him. right. It's not really a. In some ways, it's not really a new law, is it? Mm. It's just a combination. It's a way that all, that old laws are combining, mm. that form the new law. So you could say that within each one of these lower creations, is the potential for combinations that then create the possibility of a new law existing. You see. And then when the creation of the higher creation gets disassembled into its parts, it goes back to the old laws that govern the creation of a lower type. Yeah. Okay. Clever thanks. little system, isn't it? Yeah. Bit of an understatement, isn't it? <laughs> Sandra, thank you. Uh, Mary, you wanted to say? I just wanted to clarify, when you're discussing the creation of new laws, yep. you're also talking about the combination of the inbuilt rules governing each component part and the external rules that are governing that component part. I'll illustrate that in a minute. Yes, the yes, external rules. So I haven't finished this yet. So basically, it's we're recycled. Like We've got like dinosaur bits in us and other people's bits. <laughs> so we really are connected on a physical level as well, really. No, when you say we, see, now you're identifying your soul with your physical body. Uh, yes. yes you've got to stop doing that. We are not our physical body. We, the physical body is just a robot that our soul controls. Is that not the case? So this creation of our physical body, which was created by the commingling of the sperm and the egg. Yeah, I do see the body as me. Definitely. Yeah, but it can contain, because you ingest all sorts of things, 
and you breathe in all sorts of things and some of those things might be tens of thousands of years old you don't know right and and they get breathed in and processed and some of it gets stored in there you know some of it might be an element you, you need to, your body needs to make new cells so that gets stored in there and used and some of it might be waste or toxins that your body doesn't need that it needs to expel and some of it might be things that your body can't even handle by law so something like uh, lead you know at high levels for example is something like that where it can't handle it at high levels and can't can, can't get rid of it your body can't get rid of it either heavy metals are one of the problems that the body has right in terms of getting rid of and so so by law your body if your body has too many heavy metals in it you're going to die yeah because it, there's no there's nothing the body can do about it given its current condition does it make sense yeah. yep thank oh. you yep okay um if we come across to alan thank you just going to watch my times now how do those um internal or external laws how did they affect the devolution of, of humanity after a man and a man? Did, did, did the, were they affected by that? Well, let's look at the process of devolution of anything, shall we? So, so let's say just the process of devolution of, oxy of water to its, uh, its elemental parts. You could say that's a process of devolution, couldn't you say? Where this is dissolved into its elemental parts. Um, so the law governing devolution is just very simple really in, in, when you think it's complex of course in the mathematics but it's quite simple in terms of its concept and that is that when something is broken down to its elemental parts then the law governing the elemental parts will come into existence the same applies to the human soul so as the human soul devolves and and obviously you know sheds its energy systems become less evolved as a result of its devolution and and as a result its ability to control the bodies which one of the question of you guys have had a question about which we'll answer later um, is is severely restricted as a result and therefore its capacities as a devolved soul is very severely restricted yeah. the soul itself though hasn't been destroyed whereas in this case if if you look at devolution at this level this broken down into its elemental parts means that the water itself has been destroyed but it can be remade again can you see you just combine the two elements together again in a certain way and it's remade again so the reality is uh, some, someone's asked a question about saying you can't make water in a laboratory of course you can you can make water in a laboratory because all you've got to do is combine it according to the law yeah so that's all you've got to do, combine it according to the law. And if you squirt hydrogen into oxygen vapour, you'll get water. No? That's okay. <laughs> it can be. I want to explain the ne rest of this external rule thing, right? Okay, so this obviously is going up and up and up and up in the human body, is it not? So we go up to the, the cells are used in different systems. So we could say different systems, cells combine in different ways to form different systems in the human body. Is that not true? You've got the bone structure system, which is different to your muscular system, which is different to your nervous system, which is different to your cardiovascular system, and so different to your waste elimination system and so forth and so forth. And it's all required. So you could write down all of these different systems, right? that cells are involved in in different ways and because it's involved in a different way there are different laws that govern every one of those systems does that make, make sense now let's look at one of those systems which is your oxygen processing system right which is really what your lungs Inge ingesting atmosphere stripping the elemental parts of the atmosphere and breaking them down into what you need to use and expelling as waste the things you don't need to use right okay so now the oxygen has to come from an external source so we need oxygen into that system so now we have an external rules that have to start applying that so here we had oxygen here combined in a certain way 
to form water that's a part of the cell. Here we had oxygen combined in a certain way to form DNA that's a part of the cell. But here we're having oxygen entering from outside because we need it in order to breathe. We, we, uh, in fact, you could say oxygen is our fuel. In fact, it's our main, it's our most essential fuel. And it's our most essential fuel because, uh, for the physical body I'm talking about, because, because if you don't have it within three or four or five minutes, you're gone, all right? Whereas water is not such an essential fuel. You can last for days without water. Can you see the difference? But oxygen is an essential fuel. In fact, in fact, it's the fuel of all of your cellular cardiovascular system. So, so it needs to come from an external source. So trees produce it. Trees breathe in, and the seaweed in the sea produces it. They breathe in, right, carbon dioxide, and breathe out oxygen. So there's an external system external set of laws and creations that produce the oxygen and now my body has the potential of receiving this oxygen but I can only receive it under certain conditions. One condition of course is that I have to breathe it in. I can't inject it. I have to breathe it in. That make sense? Because that system is the thing that strips the oxygen. Mm. So, if, in fact, if I inject it, what happens? How fast? Yeah, by the time that oxygen bubble hits your heart, or hits your brain, same thing. Uh, so, so, can you see, you can't inject it, but you can breathe it. <laughs> so, what, what's governed that? It's your internal properties that determine you can breathe it, but it needs the external atmosphere in order for breath to occur. So that's the external rules, external flow of energy, <coughs> external creations needed. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So we now have a combination of things going on. See, the elemental system, oxygen, is used in a lot of different ways. Right? It's used in a lot of different ways. This is great, right? Because it, this, this, this is the beauty of go way of scope. Scope allows for massive combinations of elemental systems and, and, and systems below the newly complex higher in hierarchy system to exist. And what that means is that you can create a few base subsystems, combine them in different permutations and combinations, and now they come out to whole new systems that you can utilise that have information and energy and have combination flows, different laws governing them and so forth. It's a fascinating thing. Fascinating thing. Alex, I'd like to get onto your questions because you've got quite a lot of them. Um, isn't scope the same as potential? Uh, no, it's, it's not just potential. It's what things currently are as well as potential. So it defines what things currently are. So obviously there's certain things that currently exist, but it also defines potential as well. It defines both. Yeah, it actually, you can see it actually forms the basis of the new principles we'll be learning in order principles. Without scope, much of the order principles would not be possible. Scope sort of makes them possible. But let's start looking at some of your questions. Um, now, uh, Karen, Henry, where are you? The moment, yes? If we look at your question one, and then question two. Okay, question one was um, about the external rules definition. Yep. And so I was completely lost. <laughs> Had no idea what was going on there. No and I think you've explained So it was that. just, what the? What yeah. the? <laughs> I like yeah. how you said that. <laughs> completely lost here, yeah. Does the example help? It definitely, yeah. Now okay. I get that. So Thank you sort you. of get that now, the external rules definition. Yeah. Now remember, these are just things that I've made up to help your understanding. Okay. Right? So, so when I say made up, I haven't made up the scope principle. <laughs> 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 My definition of external rules has been made up to help your understanding of how, they do, how those external rules work. Does yeah. that make sense? God doesn't see them as external rules. 
and internal rules. He just sees them all as laws. Okay. They're all laws. Some laws govern the inbuilt. They are inbuilt. They govern the creation itself it, and its potentials. And some laws are external because there's a combination of other creations that affect the creation externally. So God just sees that. But I wanted to dif differentiate for you so that when you come to see this structure occur, you can see how some things are very dependent upon what happens in terms of combinations and external rules determine how things get together, how they combine. Yeah. So this is a... But the internal properties also determine how things can combine, don't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. You see, both things are required for combination. Yeah. Isn't it interesting too that the combination demonstrates that God wants everything to join together in order to create new potentials. Mm. So when yeah. we resist that process as humanity, we're resisting the creation of new potentials. The, you know the highest combination that can occur from our perspective is us combining with God's, some of God's energy. Oh. That creates our highest potential. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, yeah. yeah. So, thank you. It's a way of thinking about it. It's just a mathematical way of thinking about it. Uh, two, you want to ask two as well? Uh, so number two was... Could you explain... Uh, could you explain what you mean by energy flow mm -hmm. in the context of inbuilt rules? Yes. Can you see uh, the oxygen atom has a certain internal condition of its own energy? Mm -hmm. It has uh, the existence of its own energy. Uh, hydrogen has a different type of energy. Mm -hmm. existing within it the two form an attraction right uh, so actually the law of attraction which you've heard of from me before yeah. even works at atomic and subatomic levels right? uh -huh. the attraction means that the two things can combine mm -hmm. anything that can combine can form a new substance mm. right so that's an example of the how the energy flow inside of the uh, which is the property of mm -hmm. the of the element in this case allows for the combination permutations to occur mm -hmm. under certain conditions mm -hmm. and the conditions have to be right of course for yeah. that combination to occur mm -hmm. yeah. so for example if you if you shoot some other th other at atoms at this at, at water you may get other combinations Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But that is also determined by the inbuilt energy flow and the inbuilt properties of each one of those elements. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No worries, mm -hmm. pleasure. Um, if we can go... Now there's hundreds of questions here. Um, well, 40 or so to be exact. But um, um, Sandra, where are you? Over there, could we have one with Sandra? Your question number two, Sandra. Could we have, uh, where's Lorleen, where are you? Oh, could we have a thing with Lorleen? And we want your question number one, Lorleen. Um, so let's go, Sandra. So um, I read the um, statement that God made provisions for all new creatures and laws. Does this mean that God knows and foresees all the potentialities that his creations will create? And does this mean that God can never be surprised? Yeah, I love the question. <laughs> um, uh, yes and yes. Mm -hmm. So, so the answer to the first part, the question was, does this mean that God foresees all potentialities that his creations will create? Yes. God being the infinite being has the ability to calculate all possible permutations of all possible combinations of creation and therefore can perceive all the possible results of those combinations. Yeah. Is that omnipresence, omnipotence, or what? Which well, yes, you could say it's a part of omnipotence, isn't it? Because it, it, it means that God can foresee every possible occurrence that would possibly occur. God has limited the possible occurrences, of course, but, but when I say limited, by, by, different, by the properties of each thing, there's limitations placed upon the possible combinations, obviously. Um, but because there's so many things God has created at the subatomic level, there is just an infinite number of possible permutations, combinations that can occur. So, so, and, but the reality is God can foresee them all. So God can foresee yep. all of that. The second part of your question was, does this mean God can never be surprised? Yes, it does mean that. Wow. God is never surprised. Wow, it's amazing. So you go off and do something, God's not surprised. <laughs> Go and do something stupid. God's not surprised. 
You don't go and do something fantastic that you're really proud of. <laughs> God's not surprised. <laughs> I made you, I knew it was going to happen. But, you know, like in the spirit world, like through the mist and um, this element of surprise in Afra is like that's the biggest thing, like when he passes. God enjoys the element of surprise in the For human. Us, yeah. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Even though God is not surprised, he likes you being surprised. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> Because he, he knows that that creates, can create joy. Mm. Right? And God is very interested in creating joy. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Mm. Yeah. You, get, a, you get, a, get to have a feel of God's mm. nature then, don't you? Understanding that. Yeah. It's wonderful that God wants to create joy. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay, now we were also with, who was it? Um, yeah, that's right, Laureen. I'll just find your, yeah, question number one. Thank you. Is it the external rules that allow for the evolution of life form? And does this exemplify to the human how we can evolve into a continually changing divine angel? Yes, so there's two parts to your question. Is it the external rules that allow for the evolution of a life form? Well, no, it's both rules, both internal and external. Because the internal rules de determine the potential of a, crea of a creation. So if you look at the human soul with regard to the potential of becoming divine, which is the second part of your question, there are internal rules built into the human soul in its natural human condition that determine that through potential, there's a potential of it becoming divine. And those rules are built into the human as a, as a part of its natural condition at the soul level. So it's not something that God adds to you as you receive some of God's love. It's something that's already there as a potential. But it requires some factors, some principles have to be uh, engaged before that potential can be realised. And one of the principles is called desire. Without desire for God's love to enter you, the, uh, God, the external rules that control the Holy Spirit, which is the force by, via which God gives you love, can't be engaged. So, so the Holy Spirit is like a set of external rules that, that limit your potential to en engage the inbuilt potential, which is governed by your inbuilt laws, to receive love from God. And if you do not connect to the Holy Spirit, you will not receive the love. Does that make sense? So it's a bit like saying, you know, if I try to inject the oxygen, it's no good for me, but I can breathe it. In, in the case of the soul, it's like I, I can try to find a way to get this love. And there's many spirits, by the way, in the sixth sphere that are trying to find what element is it that makes a person immortal. So they're trying to find, discover... You know, there's, in fact, like I said to you before, there's universities in the heavens just for that purpose. But, but because they don't understand the operation of the external rules and how those external rules can be engaged, they then don't understand how to receive God's love. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so this applies right down to the sub from, a sub from the subatomic particle level right up to the highest creation, the human soul. There are external rules that govern its poten potentials, but there are also internal rules that govern its potentials. And if those internal rules did not exist, we would not be able to ever receive God's love even if the external rules existed. Does that make sense to you? There has to be, the creation itself has to have inside of itself the potential for a certain change before external things can enter it to cause that change. Right? So this is a very important thing to understand with scope. Make sense? Yes, Willie? thank you. Good. Oh, let's, uh, can we just, you're past Denise there, so let's just come forward one to Denise. In regards to when new creation occurs in the universe, example, a new sphere, does this mean that scope principles determines the circumstance of that creation and also the laws pertaining to who and when someone can enter there and also what they can do there? Yeah, nice summary. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> you're, on the, you're on the ball there, Denise. That, that's exactly what happens. The, the, the scope, scope principles combined through different processes obviously that allow for the creation of the new sphere and then also allow for what can exist in that sphere 
and a certain li- the, the level of love that must exist in that sphere and so forth. And therefore determine what creations can exist in that sphere. Does that make sense? So yes, you got a spot on there, the scope principles. This is the beauty of the scope principles. Remember we said that they guarantee creation is governed by law and we're talking about every single possible creation that is existing right now, but also every single potential creation of the future are uh, governed by scope principles. All right? All of it. Mm. And exactly what you said is exactly right with regard to creation of the spheres. But interestingly enough, it requires one, only one person to create a sphere. But it has to be at a certain, they have to be at a certain condition of love, which means they have to have engaged certain inbuilt properties in their soul, combined with certain external rules that have occurred outside of their soul that they have now engaged those potentials inside of their soul that finishes up with the creation of, this, of the sphere. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, it's driven by desire of the individual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Patricia, can we go to you? Now, it's a very interesting conversation, isn't it? All of them are, though, aren't they? I'm just checking my time. I've got, okay, seven minutes to go, sir. So. Yep. Are there laws that apply only specifically to each of us as individuals? For example, me or you? Me or you? No. Can you see why? Because if God applied something to you and not to me, then wouldn't he be partial? Mm-hmm. Of course he would. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't he have a different set of rules for you as for me? Mm-hmm. Yes, he would. Mm-hmm. So can you see there's no laws that apply differently to both of us. However, I can engage a set of potentials that make it look like I am under a different set of rules but you still have the same potentials to engage those same laws and end up in the same condition. So, for example, in the spirit world, there's a group of spirits in in the six-sphere state who actually believe that celestial spirits are a different creation of God. And the reason why they believe celestial spirits are a different creation of God is because the celestial spirits aren't bound by the same rules that the six fear spirits are bound by but the six fear spirits have the potential to also not be bound by the rules they are currently bound by if they engage the principles of transformation they would actually exceed their current condition but they don't believe that what they would prefer to believe is that God created two different types of people there's the celestial spirits who just seem to be frivolous creations of God and then there's us the six fear spirits who are serious and, th- and thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what they feel. And, and so they can ignore the frivolous ones. <laughs> you follow me? So there is the appearance to a lower conditioned person that the person in a higher condition is not by, bound by the same rules. But that's only because the person in the higher condition is bound by a new set of laws that I've discovered that they can utilise that supersede or are higher in hierarchy to the rules that apply to the person in the lower condition. But in terms of potentials and in terms of the laws themselves, they all apply to everyone. So, example of that. The law of gravity applies to me and you, but if I know aerodynamics and you don't, I'll be able to fly if I make a machine to do it. You won't. So that might then appear to you that that I can do a whole heap of things you can't. Does that make sense? Now let's put that at a higher level. Let's say you can fly, but I can teleport. (laughs) Now you might think that I'm a new creation teleporting, but the reality is I'm not. You have the potential to teleport too, but you've just got to engage the laws that do it. You've got to discover them and know them and use them. Does that make sense? It does. I, I do have another question now. Sure, fine. So hydrogen and oxygen, those mm. are both elements, but do they have different laws that apply to each of them? They do. Okay. They're both elements in that they have a, a group of laws that apply to them the same, but that because they're different elements, they have a group of different laws that apply to them 
as a result. Yeah. So it's like humans are all more similar to one another than hydrogen is similar to oxygen. No, the higher you get up in the structure, ironically, the more similar everything becomes. Okay. Mm. Okay. Of course, because it's uh, there's some laws involving that, right? Okay. Yeah. So the highest creation has the same inbuilt extinctual processes that go on to it, whether you're you or me. Mm -hmm. right? so, so emotional flow, thought flow, energy flow in your soul, both of us are capable of the same amount. If, and if we receive God's love, we're capable of an, uh, of an extended amount, but that's dependent upon how much of God's love we've received. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Okay, let's uh, go to Luli, can we, on this side, and uh, on this side. Uh, oh, let's go to Richard. I'd like to talk to Richard's problem after Luli. So. Uh, which question? Oh, sorry, Luli 2, question 2, thank you. Oh, I thought you already answered this. Um, I have. Okay. <laughs> Shall I answer it, ask it again anyway? Yeah. Okay. Um, how is it that external rules allow for a new law or creation? For example, with water being created from hydrogen and oxygen, isn't it the internal properties of their combination that create water? Yes. So the reason why I wanted to answer that further is because it's not just the internal properties of oxygen and the internal properties of hydrogen that create water. Certain external things also have to exist. So, for example, if you attempt to combine hydrogen and oxygen at, at Kelvin, you know, minus 273 degrees C, or close to, they won't combine. Right? So external, there has to be external things that exist for these two things to combine. They have to both be a gas before they can combine, right? not a solid or a liquid. But they can combine as liquids, of course, but not as a solid. So, so the reality is there's certain things that there's external properties that determine how they can combine. Can you see? So yeah, well, the laws of thermodynamics. Sorry. It's the laws of thermodynamics. Correct. Which is a whole group of laws made from a whole group of other th substances that cause those laws to exist. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So can you see? Uh, so the reason why I wanted to ask you is because uh, is because. Many of you might think that uh, there's no external thing that controls the merging of these two elements, but that's not true. There are external things that control the merging. In fact, you can also get too hot and they can't combine because they're too excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, am I trying to... <laughs> but you could say it that way, couldn't you? <laughs> the scientists could say it that way. Hmm. Man, you guys have got dirty minds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, where were we next? Oh, Richard. Come down to Richard. This is my uh, last question, Richard. I need uh, to. One or two? Uh, two, thank you. Question two, yes. What are some examples of soul based mechanisms that allow humans to communicate with God? Mm, very important question. Okay, let's, uh, let's rub out our body, shall we? And let's start talking about some soul-based mechanisms. Just briefly, it'll be a brief discussion. We're going to discuss this more in more detail when we get to day uh, five and six of our presentations, the desire principles and transformation principles. But just in terms of giving you a heads up type of thing. So the soul has internal properties that allow it to actually have desires. There's two types of, uh, you could say there's two types of emotions that exist within the soul, really. There's, besides, the, well, you could also say there's many types of energy, because there's sensory apparatus that exist in the soul, which is a different type of energy. But in terms of emotion, there's two types of emotions. There's emotions you have right now, which we shall be calling will, and there's emotions that you have that are future aspirations, which are really faith, which we will call desire. Now, the properties for communication with God are all based on desire, interestingly enough, not on will. So will determines your current condition. So you can be in the hells, deep in the hells, of, that could be your current condition, and, and still have a desire 
to communicate with God, to, to have a longing for God, and God will respond. Now, when I say God responds, there's actually, a, there's actually an external rule-based system that responds. So here's God. Remember, we're in God, so here's God. But here we're sort of seeing ourselves as individual particles that are not a part of God. So we have an imaginary state, a, a desire-based state to believe ourselves to be separate from God. Isn't that true? So, so we start to go through this process of going, maybe we're not separate from God. Maybe we can connect to God. Maybe we can actually receive things from God. Now this, there's the, the beginning of a desire. Now God has mathematical principles, laws, that measure desire, how much of it you have and what type you have. So God is especially sensitive to desires you have for God. In fact, God is the most that that is the most sensitivity God has to everything. That God even knows when you're going to have one before you had one. That's how that's how clever God is because God knows, of course, all possible permutations and combinations that can possibly exist at any one time. So God can predict when you're going to have one, right? Mathematically, it's possible to do it, but gee, you've got to be a very good mathematician, and God obviously is the infinite mathematician, so he can predict it. Now, as a result of that, that means that when you exercise desire of true longing in your soul, there's an opening that occurs in your own soul towards God. Does that make sense? And this engages a bit like breathing oxygen. It's like you could hold your breath. Right? And you could hold your breath for about, you know, if you're pretty good, you'd probably hold it for maybe three minutes, maybe even. So holding it three minutes, but eventually... There's this internal, you call it an instinct, right? You just go, <gasps> I need to get some air now, right? Because I'm going to die if I don't, right? Desire is a bit different to that in that it's not instinctual. It's actually something that you have to generate from within yourself. It's something that you've got to want for yourself. But it's similar in the sense that once you have it, it, there's a, it, it produces this sort of longing, need. Of receiving something. Now, what that does is, contr is it controls the Holy Spirit, which is a force. A, it's actually you can see it sort of like a, a tube. A, it's a, like a wormhole. You could think of it as, which which contains the ability to transmit love from your soul, at which which can only receive love if desire is present. So. God made it that God can't pump love into your soul. God made it only that soul, the soul had to open itself to the flow of love. It's controlled by the free will that God gave you. And then once you exercise this free will through desire, this creates an opening in your soul which attracts the conduit. So remember the Holy Spirit is just a conduit through which God's love, which is all, you know, God's all around you, so obviously love must be there right there next to you, ready to be received. And this conduit now gets connected, bang, into your soul, and bang, away it goes. And actually, you can see it. There's actually in the soul, there's a location through which this conduit connects. Right? And the crown chakra of the spiritual body reflects the location in the soul. But, and in fact, the crown of your spiritual body is not actually the soul receiving love, but rather your soul receiving love through, uh, sorry, your God transmitting love to your soul and your soul transmitting the love through the physical universe to your spiritual body. So that's actually what you're seeing when you're a spirit, when divine love is received. Do you, do you, do you follow that? Or is that a bit complicated? The reality is your soul exists outside of this universe. It exists in another dimension, outside of this universe, outside of all the 35 spheres. It's in a different universe altogether. And, and your soul, once it receives divine love, starts transmitting instantly that divine love through to its bodies. And the way that it gets the connection from the soul to the spiritual body is through this pipe that gets connected from the soul through the crown chakra to the spiritual body. That's the only way that love can flow. But that is another complex discussion in its own self. So, so here we have desire being the activating force 
inside the body that opens the potential of the soul. So the soul has a potential, but it's only opened by the desire. Once the desire is open, now the soul is capable of receiving. But desire, from God's definition of it, has to be based on truth. So it has to be a real desire. It can't be just a fake one or an addiction or any of those things. It has to be a pure desire as measured by God's standard of truth. Right? So that's why the Holy Spirit could also be called the spirit of truth. Because it only comes to the soul when the soul is in a condition of truth. So that's the conditions. Now you can see the Holy Spirit is, gum, is external rules. The soul has its inbuilt properties and its inbuilt potentials. When desire is activated by the soul, it's now engaging the external rule and allowing the flow of love from God to the soul. And given the fact that that love exists all around the soul, it's quite a simple mechanism from God's perspective. But it exists all around the soul in the union state, in the 36th sphere, you could call it. It's not really a sphere, it's a new universe. It exists in that state, not in the physical universes. Okay. That brings up a lot more questions, but I haven't got time to answer them. <laughs> so you. hopefully that's answered it's it enough for you, you to, uh, to understand. So what we're going to do now is have a break. We'll have a break for 10 minutes. Um, so if we can come back at... Uh, 23 past 3 and we will get started on a short discussion of the human law comparison. Thanks guys.